Travel all over the countryside, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, travel all over the countryside, ask the Leyland brother. Whatever it is that you want to see, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, no matter whatever that happens to be, ask the Leyland brother. Come on, me in and then join in the fun, travel all over Australia. Well, in this program, we've got a really unusual lineup of stories. Where to first, Mark? First, we go to New Zealand, to the North Island of New Zealand, at a small place called Kaitaia on the north coast, where they gather seaweed for use in industry and medicine. Then we come back to Tumut in New South Wales to have a look at millet growing and the manufacture of millet brooms. Where to then, Mark? Well, our final story comes from Western Australia. We travel over to the Bodagiro Stub, which is quite near Perth, to see the beautiful Andalusian horses performing. These horses are sometimes known as the Spanish dancing horses. Mrs Lynn Agland of Cardiff in New South Wales wrote, I have heard of people in New Zealand who live on the beaches and collect seaweed. I can't imagine how or why one would go about collecting seaweed. Can you show us something about this unusual occupation? We have come to a small beach at the top end of the North Island where the Collins family, Mariah and Johnny, live here on the beach. Johnny, how long have you been here getting seaweed? 31 years. What sort of uh, seaweed is it? Agar. It's the agar seaweed. It goes on the rocks, but you can't get it until it's a uh, big tide like now, full moon and new moon tides when the tides go well out, you see. Is there many people along here doing this? Oh, quite a few, yeah. Quite well, a few. They make a living out of it, or is it just a part-time thing like with yourself? You, can't, you know, you can't make a living out of it. To knock off a job, to, to give a job up and come out in and think you can make a living out, you can't. Not enough money? Well, nothing in it, nothing in it, no. Nothing in it, but a uh, little bit of spare, spare money and so forth. Come in, girl. you can come with me. Come on. Come on. Johnny is on a war pension and cannot manage hard work, so Mariah does a collecting of the agar seaweed. Their home nestles beneath the cliffs of Reef Point, on the west coast, near the small township of Aipara. Mariah collects agar every day that the weather and tides will permit. The sack connected to the inner tube holds the seaweed. Mariah scans a rocky bottom for the red fern-shaped fronds of agar. about a dozen people living along the beach near Reef Point who collect the agar seaweed. Some wear wetsuits and some don't. The seaweed is sold to Davis Gelatine in Christchurch. For many years certain varieties of seaweed found around the world have been known as a potential source of an inert jelly-like substance commonly known as agar. This substance is highly prized by many industries manufacturing foodstuffs, pharmaceuticals and chemicals. The tasteless, odourless powder is extracted by cooking the seaweed under steam pressure, filtering the liquid, freezing, thawing, sterilising and a few other processes in between. Collecting the weed is the easy part, and that's hard work. Sometimes we get out, go out quite deep, you know, dive under because they're really big ones out for it, eh? But other than that, well, when it's too rough, of course, we stay up around the side because you get bashed about too much, eh? The rocks, the sea. You still pluck it in the winter time, of course, if you've got a wet suit and if you're, you know, not too cold. But other than that, oh, yuck, stay by the fire. <laughs> Mariah's nephews would rather collect power shells and sea anemones. 
The row of the sea anemone is a prized delicacy along the coast here. Sig. Sig. Come on. Can not the Mary's Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Surprisingly, it's not as bad as it looks. The gathered seaweed has to be sorted. See, you can get them sometimes, they're fairly clean. But we are a bit fussy at times, you know. They're not supposed to, but... I mean, you're supposed to be more fussy at that, but... <laughs> I mean, it does uh, decrease in the weight. <laughs> Any other type of weed or rubbish has to be thrown away. The seaweed has to be spread out to dry in the sun before it can be packed into bales for shipment. It takes two or three days to dry, but once dry, it is lighter and easier to handle, particularly when loading for transport to the Davis Gelatine factory. There are about 500 people gathering agar seaweed around New Zealand. This produces a total of 20 to 30 tonnes of processed agar per year. The agar is used in confectionery, cosmetics and in canning some meats, such as tongues. In its sterile state, it makes the only known substance for bacterial cultures in hospitals and medical research. A fascinating product from King Neptune's garden. We're just outside the township of Tumut in New South Wales. And just here is a sea of millet. And in that acreage of millet there, there'd be roughly the makings of 60,000 millet brooms. Mrs Vera Roddy of Tumut suggested that we might like to show the story of millet broom manufacturing. A millet crop takes six months from planting to reach maturity. Harvesting of the millet is carried out around February and March. Here at Mervyn Alchin's farm, we find the men starting to table the millet. Tabling is the process of bending over the stalks to form an interlaced table of millet. A small knife is used to remove the millet heads, a back-breaking job, and the whole crop has to be harvested in this manner. No mechanical harvester is available in this age-old industry. The millet tops are spread out on the table in the sun to dry. Six to seven hundred tons of millet is grown in the Tumut area per year, worth over five hundred thousand dollars. Right, as the millet is cut, Mike, it's laid on these tables. Uh, now it's laid there to dry, say for a day. It all depends on the weather. If the weather's real hot, uh, but generally this time of the year, about a day, and then uh, it's taken into the shed and and put over racks for tying. It takes about a pound of millet, Mike, to, uh, to make a broom. It takes a variety of millet. It takes the short millet, what they call the insides. It takes the short and the long uh, in, a, in a crop. If a manufacturer comes in, now the broom millet that's in this paddock, uh, he can take straight into his factory and he can start making brooms. He don't have to go buying millet anywhere else. After drying in the sun, the millet is taken to the shed for further drying and removal of the millet seed. Now this is poling the millet, or racking the millet, and the idea of this is for drying and curing. We've come into the township of Tumut to see how they make brooms from the millet. After the millet has been hand graded, this machine sorts the individual stems into accurate lengths before the brooms can be made. The Tumut Millet Growers Co-op uses about 80 tonnes of millet a year here. This is one of only two millet broom factories in the country areas. The millet is wired onto the broom handle by a practised hand.
This factory produces 150 dozen brooms per week and provides employment for 10 people. The yearly output of millet brooms here is about 100,000. Wage costs are making it difficult for the millet broom to compete with cheaper plastic brooms. Although the inherent spring of the millet is impossible to reproduce by substitute materials. The 18 millet broom factories can still sell all they produce. Finding men willing to work in the millet fields is the biggest problem according to Merv Alchin. It is hard to get people to take on the back-breaking work and with no mechanical harvester available this could be the end of the millet broom industry. It would be a shame to see the millet brooms disappear. They have long been a part of every home. We'd like to thank Vera Roddy of Tewitt for asking us to show the millet broom story. I know they're not all as big as this one but this should make any witch, I mean wife, happy. <laughs> Our budget hasn't increased on this program so much that we can travel halfway around the world to bring you a story. We're not in Spain, we're in Western Australia. We're at the El Caballo Blanco Hotel. And we've come here because this is part of the Potiguero Stud, that's the Andalusian horse stud, where the Andalusian horses from Spain are trained to do all kinds of tricks. Now, they're mostly known by some people as the Spanish dancing horses. They're quite famous horses. They were used by the conquistadors who went into America. In fact, they were the first horses introduced to the Americans. And Napoleon's supposed to have rode an Andalusian. We've come here because of this letter, which is from Mrs. R.C. Jones from Shortland in New South Wales. It says, my mother is at present in Western Australia and recently sent the children postcards of the Bodeguero Stud, part of the El Calabanco Hotel. Now, as a stallion looked so smart, we thought it might make an interesting segment in your program. Well, I think it will too, and in a moment we're going to take a look at the horses. The hotel and motel is the showpiece of the Bodeguero stud, and no expense has been spared in the lavishly appointed complex to capture the Spanish atmosphere. From the architecture to the imported glazed tiles, everything is designed to give the visitor the impression that this could be in Spain. Nowhere is this more evident than in front of owner Ray Williams' luxurious home, two kilometres away. Here, the activity begins early with the daily training programs for the horses. Training is under the supervision of Spanish riding and training master, Senor Raymond Guerrero Benitez. It takes four to five years of training with the same rider and horse to reach perfection. But even within two years, some of the better horses are advanced enough to put on a good show. It takes a great deal of patience to teach the tricks which last only a matter of a few seconds. In most cases, at least three months to master each foot movement. Raymond is only too willing to explain to any interested visitor the name of each movement and how it is rehearsed and rehearsed until it is mastered. It's, uh, we call it in Spanish, saludo. Um, 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 um. See? We also have to make very, very good collation for doing this kind of movement. Now the whole, this another, um, is that one, it's only half saluted. It's only point one knee. Oh, no. oh. One. See? This another one, this only one knee. Have to put in the, the knee inside, and it's how it's going back. That's the other one, it's a, We do. Oh. See? That's a tunic. We use this one when we have some kind of fiesta in Spain. Uh, it's a Spanish uh, country is very Catholic. <laughs> and we're doing this kind of thing in front of the Virgin. Like a reverence for Indonesia and for like a people doing, you know? Mm -hmm. Naughty boy. Training for young horses begins between 18 months and two years old. 
and at first consists of simple handling exercises. Ahead lies a lifetime of training and showing for each thoroughbred. Andalusians make excellent harness horses, noted for their showy, proud, high stepping action. But before they can use the equally showy carriages, they must complete many months of practice in the training gig. There's more to see at the Bodeguero stud than horses. In this museum section here, we have a collection of what most people regard to be the finest collection of horse-drawn vehicles anywhere in the world. And it's pretty easy to see why. Dozens of perfectly preserved and restored carriages spanning many generations of what was the finest of their day are housed under the one roof. Their total value in excess of one million dollars. From practical vehicles like the hand-operated fire tender to the showpiece of the display, this magnificent English coach of the Dick Turpin era. Well, among the many fine coaches which are on display here is this one, which is quite interesting. This is uh, known as the governess's car, and it was a little bit different to uh, all the others. Everything has a special purpose, and this one was designed to carry the children and the governess. It had to have a very quiet pony on it, um, because obviously carrying the children around in here would have been a bit dangerous with a spirited horse. And uh, it was a bit unusual in that the governess would have got in the back here and would have sat sideways in the middle. This would obviously have belonged to a fairly wealthy family because it wasn't the sort of thing that everybody could afford. Around midday, the stable area of Bodeguero stud is a hive of activity as the horses are made ready for the daily display to take place later in the afternoon at an exhibition arena attached to the hotel. The real business here, though, is the serious business of breeding. Since the beginning of the stud in 1971, it has grown rapidly from five mares and the foundation stallion, Bodeguero to its present size numbering hundreds. For the next two years, these little fellows can run freely about the paddocks, growing and developing strong muscles for the training ahead. Bodeguero's progeny and that of other imported stallions is the responsibility of stud manager Malcolm Stewart, who also conducts the exhibition each afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to El Caballo Blanco Hotel for this afternoon's presentation by the Andalusians from the Bodeguero Stud. Uh, these two white horses, both imported from Spain, Escribiente and Herizano, uh, they've competed regularly in the Perth Royal Show. The horses not only are used in harness but are used under saddle. Um, they have uh, quite considerable prowess under saddle as well as under harness but these particular pair seem to get on so well together that we use them for special promotions and demonstrations outside of the uh, complex here. Since the introduction of the Andalusian breed to Australia in 1971, the Bodeguero stud have purchased several additional stallions. It is our pleasure now to introduce the most recent acquisition, Barillador. In 1974, Barillador was accredited as one of the top bullfighting horses of Madrid. He's beautifully ridden this afternoon by Spanish riding and training master, Senor Ramon Guerrero Benitez, who joined the stud in January of 1975. Senor Ramon has performed right throughout Europe and the United Kingdom with the famed Don Alvare de Meg Andalusian School of Equestrian Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, Barillador, ridden by Senor Ramon. The floating movement at the trot that we have here is called Passage. This is where a horse is working above the ground. Uh, quite, uh, takes quite a lot of training and uh, as you can see is very, very elegant.
pleasure now to introduce our old man of the stud, the famed 10-year-old Bodeguro, working on the long reins. It's uh, possibly twice as hard to acquire uh, the horse to do uh, what you command because you don't have the use of your feet or legs or seat. All you have is the uh, command of a whip and your reins. So you can see that Bodeguro has to have quite a long period of training to bring him up to this very, very high standard. There is possibly no better way to round off the day at the Bodeguero stud than to relax with the Mardi Gras night of entertainment at the El Caballo Blanco Hotel. Spanish, the dancing Spanish, the decor is Spanish, and of course the Andalusian horses are Spanish. But now they're all part of Australia, thanks to Ray Williams who brought them here. Our thanks also go to Mrs Jones, who asked us to film the Bodeguero stud in Western Australia. Brother, come on, me in and then join in. 